everybody. Um, I've been on the road for two weeks and got back last night, so you'll bear with me because my voice is, uh, is a bit crackly today. But thank you, as always, for joining us at SG Innovate. Thank you for being a part of what we're trying to do. We're big believers in the importance of the work of UNDP and the importance of sustainable development goals, and we have this series that we have uh, ever so cleverly named the SDG Innovate uh, to go along with the SG Innovate uh, goal, and we'd like to see how to have you be a part of that. Our basic mission is to work with entrepreneurial scientists to help them form and build companies in the deep tech area. So to say deep tech for us is defined not so much as it is AI or it's something else, but instead, is there a scientific core? Is the barrier to entry high? Is the technology And so for us to be thinking about sustainability and corporate initiatives and ESG, when we think about ethics and sustainability and governance, these are values and priorities that we'd like to continue to work on together with you. Importantly, the UNDP's work around sustainable development goals is something that we believe a lot in because we believe that consumer tech, and you'll forgive me if I offend anyone, we think about convenience. And we think there's a lot of focus on increasing convenience. But what we think is important is for us to tackle really tough and human condition problems. How do we think about food? How do we think about energy? How do we think about health care? Things that affect humanity more so than how do we think about taking a two-hour delivery down to a one-hour delivery. So we'd like to try and concentrate your thinking and your capabilities along those lines, please. And we encourage the discussion and the dialogue. And so Bradley will be leading the panel through a series of uh, discussions and interaction, but it's going to be a function of how engaged and involved you would like to be. So please ask the panelists whatever you would like to ask, because the dialogue is the, is the key value. This is what we really want to try and do. We have some ideas. We spoke a little bit uh, in advance of this afternoon's session about some areas we'd like to work on together, and what we will do is be announcing in the next couple of days some upcoming events in which a very specific set of goals or challenges will be articulated, and then we'd love you to engage in those that you think speak to you. Not everybody would like to be involved in everything, but there'll be some that might be important to you personally or professionally, and we'd like to make those visible to you and we'd like you to be involved in those. So we'll be either through our website or other means making those known to you, and we'll be doing those in collaboration with our good friends at UNDP. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do now is just say, again, thank you for being a part of it. Please help us build some important companies. So whether you're a mentor, an investor, a founder, a teammate, or a corporate that's here to try and be a good partner, all of those have critical and important roles to play. And so the key is how can we build companies and make a difference to the human condition? And so that's uh, the purpose of today. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is now do our traditional, and you'll, you'll know in advance, we're going to do the we were here memory moment. So if everybody would mind just jumping up, and we're going to do the one, two, three cheese. And if you don't want to have your face involved, then look away. But otherwise, we're going to be here. So if I can ask everybody to please jump up. Now I'm going to hand over to uh, my friend Bradley, who's going to take it forward from here. So please give a warm welcome to uh, Brad from UNDP. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Well, 
Thank you very much, and thanks for joining us uh, for this discussion on uh, the future of sustainable finance. Let me just, before we start, bring up our panelists, our distinguished panelists, please. Come on up. Great, great, great. Um, kick off a quick round of, of introductions. Um, I guess starting from left to right. Uh, um, Nena, uh, Nena is the CEO and, and chairperson of of uh, Asian Ven Venture Philanthropy Network. Um, I guess we verified today it's just about the largest uh, network of impact investment funders um, in the world. Um, Nena is one of the world's leading kind of evangelist um, thinkers and doers in the impact investment space, and has been building ecosystems in this in this space for for many years. And pleased to have her here. She's become a very good friend of mine here in Singapore too. Uh, Professor David Lee, um, many of you probably already know. Um, one of the, again, kind of one of the world's leading thinkers in especially digital finance and, and that connection between um, digital finance and development, and especially sustainable development, um, has written books published widely and um, yeah, we're very pleased to have him on stage with us too. So thank you for being here with us. Um, Dimitri, Dimitri Mariasen is the UN, UN Development Program. Ah representative in Armenia, and also we worked closely together too um, when I was based there. Um, and he's um, within the United Nations, certainly one of the leaders in sustainable finance and innovative finance models, um, pioneering uh, for the UN much more broadly, um, in fact, around the world. So thanks to, to all of you for, for being here. Um, to begin, um, I'll maybe just sort of try to set the stage a little bit of context. Um, I guess now that the SDB, SDG picture is gone, uh, how, how many of you feel like you know what the SDGs are all about? And have, well, raise your hand. How many of you feel comfortable in describing what the SDGs are? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. So, I don't know, maybe a third of you or so, right? So that's probably not, not so great, but um, the, uh, well, it means that maybe the, the UN or the world is not properly communicating um, this, but I think it's, it's, to simplify what the sustainable development goals are, um, it's better not to think about them in terms of colors or numbers or, you know, 1.1 or 1.3, but think about them much more broadly as, a, a blueprint, or even better than that, a kind of a, a blueprint and a commitment of the world um, to to really achieve a better, more sustainable uh, future for all of us, right? So that's what it is, right? Um, it's a blueprint, it's a global commitment um, to do that. Um, and then another starting point, well, what is sustainable finance? I, let's, uh, for the purpose of this, I don't want to, this discussion to be about debating what that is, um, or different definitions of this, um, but for the purposes of our discussion, let's make it a, a, a very broad definition. Um, let's think about it in terms of mobilizing capital to that better vision of the world, to a more sustainable world, a more sustainable planet. Just think about it in those terms, um, whether it's massive pools of private capital, whether it's a small social entrepreneur um, selling, um, you know, more sustainable granola, for example. Um, so um, let's think about it maybe as broadly as possible. And, and, and in this discussion, I'd like to particularly pull out, well, maybe starting with what is the current state of play with sustainable finance? Um, why is it important to Singapore too? Um, but also, how can, sustainable finance and technology together kind of catalyze each other to, to really um, create the, the kind of solutions to the really big problems that Steve's talking about, like ending pollution, like that haze that we've had over the past couple of weeks, like ending Singapore's recycling problem. Um, the big ones, right? Um, and concrete ones, concrete but big. Um, so that's what I'd like to start pulling out in, in this discussion. So let me um, maybe start um, with Nena. Um, 
Yeah, could you give us your take? Um, you're right in the middle of all this, in sustainable finance. Um, what's the context now? How, how, is this, how has it evolved? And, and kind of what are the opportunities going, going forward? Um, thanks, Bradley. And uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, you know, it's interesting. This is the second event I'm speaking at today, and both are on sustainable finance. Uh, very different audiences, very different group convening it. But I think that itself shows you that uh, sustainable finance is here to stay. Um, this morning, actually, um, a, a bank, um, Afro-Asia bank, actually, that works both in Asia and Africa, invited us to, to share about innovations in, in sustainable finance. And, you know, more and more I'm finding that mainstream capital institutions are actually interested in learning more about sustainable finance. Um, with, with, with UNDP here, you know, it's natural, right? Impact is front and center of everything that the UN does. But the moment a, a financial institution that has profit at, at its center starts talking about sustainability, then you know that change is here to stay. And I think that's, that's something that's very positive to begin this discussion. Why is sustainable finance and why are we suddenly seeing a lot of innovations in sustainable finance in Asia? Well, all of us are aware that, you know, the amount of wealth that's been generated in Asia over the past decade has been huge. But I don't know how many of us realize that eight of the ten most polluted cities in the world are in Asia. So, you know, yes, we've had a lot of growth, we've done really well economically, but we've also paid a huge price for it. I mean, it's not just here in Singapore where we are struggling to breathe or we're coughing and, you know, the skies are red in Indonesia or we need a Greta Thunberg to get up and say, you know, I hate you. I think, I think we see that all around us. And unless and until we look at businesses or we look at, um, you know, capital um, across the spectrum in terms of how does that help make the change, we're not really going to see the change happen. I mean, in the next decade itself, for Southeast Asia alone, we need $3 trillion if we are to achieve the SDG goals that you put up just for Southeast Asia. That $3 trillion is not going to come from philanthropy. It's not going to come from social investment. It's going to come from mainstream capital. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are seeing the innovations in, in social finance. I'm going to give it back to you, but you know, one of the things I think we should also touch on is why is Singapore wanting to be at the forefront of this? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about that, but I don't want to the mic then mm, quickly, quick, quick, yeah. quickly tell you so I think you know I mean the fact that SG Innovate is hosting us Singapore's long prided itself on being the hub for innovation and I think social finance is something else that that I think the the authorities here whether it's the monetary authority whether it's the government that's something I think that they're very very keen to push um, starting actually with looking at better integration of ESG in terms of how reporting is done in terms of how companies here in Singapore decide to measure themselves. Um, I think there's, we are very close to issuing guidelines on responsible financing. We're seeing uh, a lot more interest on ba from banks here in Singapore in terms of issuing green instruments, whether they be green bonds, whether they be, look they be looking at green loans. So I think um, very much, and the fact that you've looked at setting up the impact accelerator here in Singapore. So I think there is um, very much the trend and very much the norm of what Singapore likes to do in terms of actually leading the innovation. Thanks. Thanks. Then maybe I'll talk, uh, turn to, to you, uh, Professor. Um, so there, there really is an urgency, the urgency of now, right? Um, I, mean, I think all of you must have been riveted by the coverage the last few days of the United Nations General Assembly and Greta at, and the climate um, summit, um, which I, I think is really galvanizing whole new generations of, of young people to, to move um, on this. So given that it is so urgent, um, Professor, how can technology help us do this? How can technology help us um, not just scale sustainable finance, but, but to really reach, find some of these solutions? 
Um, first of all, I want to say that it's, it's really a dream sitting here discussing this. Um, I left the financial world in 2012, and uh, I always feel that I'm a refugee from the financial world. Uh, but now I feel that um, everybody is moving in the same direction, and that is really um, heartening. And when I read that it's S uh, SG Innovate, so SDG Innovate, so SG Innovate, that was really interesting. It's really a pleasure you know, to, to um, talk to Steve Leonard and see him today, and also thank to UNDP for inviting me here today. And technology actually has, has gone leap and bounds, and a lot of time we cannot catch up with them. I'll just give a few very simple examples of what happened in the last 10 years. With the digital devices, we could do a lot more uh, things than before. And this is where you could see like M-Pasa with the SMS that I think oh, we have seen that impact. And, and I've seen the impact myself in Kenya as well. Um, then we have the, the smartphone um, in 2010. Uh, it's an, another leap with the QR code. With the QR code, we actually bypass all the costs of doing business with using the post system. And that's perfect because I just scan your QR code and I don't have to go through the post system. And one of the 16 or 17 goals that I see from there is that you can see a lot more fair competition there because post itself is actually in some ways is a very high business cost. And you want to do business with payments, you have the post system. But Alipay somehow it passed through that and they have the QR code and post system is gone in China in some ways. And you don't pay has a great competition. So QR code is another jump, and if you want to use QR code, you really need to think about not having a post system. You know, they, they, that is the greatest advantage of having a QR code. And the next come um, in 2012 and 2013, I started looking at cryptocurrency, uh, where we may have made some mistakes or we may not have, but that's peer-to-peer -peer payment. Again, uh, it will actually lower the cost uh, World Bank is trying to lower the cost for um, remittance to below 6%. Uh, we have never been successful. So we're just scratching our head to say, how do we do that? You know? And perhaps we have a peer-to-peer -peer payment uh, through the cryptocurrency. And of course, sure enough, now we, everybody hear about Libra coin by the Facebook, and everybody's sitting up and saying, yes, maybe that's something that we, we could do. And of course, underneath that, that kind of peer-to-peer -peer payment is a new technology that is blockchain. Uh, again, a lot of, of the goals that we are talking about that can be empowered by this technology of blockchain. It's about empowering the, the weak, the needy. Uh, it's about empowering people that uh, really uh, are small, you know, like country which is small. Uh, we are weak in many ways that we don't have water. You know, it's empowering the smaller countries, uh, the weaker population and so on. That, that. So um, you can see the technology has gone to a stage that we have like QR code and then we have uh, the idea of cryptocurrency, peer-to-peer -peer payment. Then we have this distributed ledger. And then we are coming to the next stage, which I think Steve was talking about, the convergence of deep tech. The yeah. convergence of deep tap is even more powerful and underlying that you need blockchain because technology, deep technology can do a lot of good and deep technology can do a lot of harm as well. Um, blockchain too can do a lot of good and can do a lot of harm but uh, it perhaps it's a bit more neutral. So the, the technology itself has come a big cycle mm. uh, in the sense that we are always searching for better, cheaper, faster production efficiency. But now we are seeing technology that enhances collaboration efficiency rather than just production efficiency. Right. And that type, I would summarize everything in that, they have interoperability func function as um, collaboration uh, efficiency type of technology. So to summarize, it's, it's the kind of technology that will enhance collaboration that uh, will propel us forward to have inclusion and to achieve our SDG. Thanks. Can I just follow up on that? Um, so you talked about the potential in the smaller, poorer countries for um, crypto, digital currency to, to, for example, reduce to zero essentially the, the cost of remittances and, 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 and to be a force for good. But 
But what about some of the risks? What are some of the potential downsides? Yeah, there, there's always a lot of risk in any technology, and I think the first thing we need to do is to try to understand what the technology can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. So I think um, we have we have gone past the stage where you mentioned the word Bitcoin, and everybody say, "Oh, let's let's get away from that." Mm -hmm. Now say, "Okay, it's Bitcoin. Let's learn about learn about the programming, mm -hmm. and then start learning about the risk of technology." And technology risk management become a very important topic. Mm -hmm. for not only for corporate, for government, but for individual as well. So technology risk management become a very important topic because we need to know what technology can do, especially what harm it can do. And in some technology can do a lot more harm mm -hmm. than others. But one, once you understand what they can do, then you can think of ways to manage it. Mm -hmm. it's all, there's no perfect solution. Mm -hmm. And what we have to do is continue to balance the innovation uh, with the regulation to en to ensure that we are guided towards the di right direction. And you can see in Singapore, we start talking about ethics of AI. I'm sure later we're talking about ethics of blockchain, ethics of deep, deep technology. And I think we need to start thinking about what we should do because the biggest problem about technology at this moment and the kind of risk is that we always have a legal entity behind everything that we do. And we have, when we have, and all this legal entity was set up over the thousand of years, partly because we need to have trusted institution mm. to ensure that when you have trust, there's a way to manage it. But the new technology that we are having, like blockchain uh, and AI, so they are just app. So in terms of financial products, we always talk about what's the risk of the product mm. and then what's the complexity of the product. So then from the regulator's viewpoint, there's a legal entity behind. Therefore, we could impose a certain um, you know, restriction, regulation, legislation surrounding it and manage it. But when you have an app, when you have a software, it is not a legal entity. So when it's not a legal entity, the whole entire paradigm that we build out as a trust system is beginning to make it very difficult and challenging for regulators and for people um, like us to say that we want to promote a technology, but really, do we have enough instrument yeah. to um, direct some of this app? Is this app suitable for somebody uh, who doesn't know how to use it? Is it too dangerous for, for the person? With, with this, uh, and, and, and then in many of the poorer countries, there's very little regulatory framework to help any of these folks. Yeah, I think that, that is another issue about enforcement. Yeah. 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 So a lot of countries, um, they, the enforcement is weak, yeah. right? And, and when enforcement is weak and you have technology, you can penetrate, and then the country will lose, uh, lose okay. monetary policy, sovereignty, and fiscal policy as well, because taxation. Yeah. And if the government doesn't have taxation, the government cannot survive. So yeah. uh, there will be no government. So there, there are a lot of issues that we need to think about. And we're just at the beginning stage. And the university, uh, that's the direction that we try to have a lot more PhD students, professors, and, and ties them to have interest, and hope, hoping to get a lot more funding to set up yeah. centers to say that we really need to look deeply into the technology and it's no more just looking at financial engineering because financial engineering is fine, it's just a product, it's financial, there's a legal entity behind. When you talk about fintech engineering, the technology side has got no legal entity and it's technology. So you need to know technology besides you know corporate finance, investment banking, private banking, wholesale banking, you need to know technology and that is where it becomes extremely difficult. Thanks. I mean, I, I think what we're really, Steve and I and, and SG Innovate and UNDP together are really interested in is, is the possibility of using technology Oh, to help countries, entire populations, communities really leapfrog in their development, right? And, and to a more sustainable form of development. So that's what's really exciting and compelling about this sort of partnership. Um, to, to turn to Dimitri now, so back more focused on, um, on sustainable finance. In your view, what are the sort of key ingredients in, a, in the ecosystem to make sustainable finance work? between technology, impact, and money. Uh, thank you, Bradley. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. I've traveled a long way, and I'm not gonna do a poll of how many of you know where Armenia is. I currently serve there. It's a, it's a fascinating landlocked country. 
Uh, and they say that landlocked countries and small islands are very similar because they are surrounded by by, by something that is harder, harder to, to penetrate. And I think Singapore is, of course, much more connected than Armenia. But one of the things that you can do is connect across the globe countries in different situations. Um, the second introductory remark I'd like to say is that these pictograms are not the UN's pictograms. They are not UN's SDGs. And uh, uh, they are about you and I and all of us. Uh, this is very concrete stuff. This is air we're going to breathe and our children are going to breathe. And this is the, the food and whether or not the cancer screening can take, you know, five minutes or five seconds and whether people actually do it and how much governments spend and how much they don't care or care about their citizens in various situations. This is very concrete stuff put on one page, a very ambitious page. Um, and um, I, I liked uh, how you highlighted the high cost of SDGs. Uh, another way to say... The, uh, this is that SDGs are an amazing market. They estimate that SDGs are about 19 trillion dollars in business opportunities until 2030, which is the deadline for achieving those goals. That means every single target, be it on sustainable consumption or poverty reduction, can be turned into a business proposition. So it's not a market in disguise, it's a market right in our face. It is a market in our face, but we need to be smart about how we uh, unlock it, and technology is one of the real answers to that. So um, maybe answering your question, Bradley, uh, I'd like to start by, by explaining why is UNDP here? Uh, why is UNDP talking about sustainable finance, impact investment, tech, uh, well, there are, you know, let me structure it in three pieces. Uh, then why, actually, then what we do, and I'll give the example of Armenia, which is something that I am responsible for, and then how we do it. Uh, the why is very clear. Uh, so to unlock this market potential, uh, we need to connect uh, people that don't necessarily talk to each other. Uh, we believe that uh, technology and private finance uh, can be brought together to develop solutions for these very tough challenges much more effectively than UNDP, other international organizations, donor governments, or even national governments can do. Uh, that is because we're not dealing with sectoral problem, problems. We're not dealing with your build, construct, and operate transfer type of problems. We're dealing with complex problems. Nothing, no problem that is related to climate change is just a climate or environment problem. It is profoundly social. It affects lives in many ways. It's very damaging for the economies. And so to tackle these, you need to have complex solutions. So that's why we believe at the, in the UN that to achieve even half of these goals by 2030, we need tech and finance to come together. Now, what, do, what can you do concretely in a country like Armenia, which is a lower middle income country, so a developing country facing a lot of challenges on its development path? Um, what we think we can do is first create an ecosystem, uh, bring players together that don't work together naturally. Uh, and to do this, we've set up an impact accelerator, which we called Impact Aim. Uh, this is a, a convening space for entrepreneurs, tech people, uh, and government, as well as UN folks with technical expertise in specific areas. And as a result, what we have is rounds of acceleration. So you know that accelerators in the business world are a commonplace. Everybody is doing this incubate, accelerate, go to venture capital. This is absolutely normal in Silicon Valley, here in the UK, and so on. First of all, it's not so easy to do this in emerging countries, but it's even harder to do this in emerging countries with a social and environmental good in mind. So we've set up the first impact accelerator that specifically helps find, nurture, and then bring to investable venture stage tech ideas that have a clear social and environmental outcome. We've run four rounds of that accelerator, um, and two of them were focused on climate tech solutions. Uh, the newest round being launched now is GovTech, so solutions um, such as you know, AI-based solutions or blockchain-based solutions that help governments provide better services to their citizens. Um, and then the next one coming is Agrotech. And you will ask me, okay, Dmitry, what are those solutions? Let me give you one example that I like the most personally. Um, one of the ventures in our climate tech accelerator is called uh, Forest Bear. And they have developed a sensor that registers forest fires, but it doesn't do this with temperature like other many similar sensors do. It does this with sound 
because forest fires produce sound, and a very specific one, with a very clear frequency and so on. What it also does, it captures the illegal logging. The chainsaw has a very, very strong sound, as you all know, and many countries around the world, both forest fires and illegal, illegal logging are killing local economy, killing environment, and are really detrimental to the country's long-term development. So it's the cheapest, really cool uh, sensor little thing, real little tech, but very deep in many ways, including the concept behind it, that if scaled can really change the way governments and private sector alike address this very interesting problem. Uh, so this is just one of the many examples that we, we believe in, and this is the what of what we're trying to do. Another big chunk, which I will not describe in detail, more detail now, but maybe we can come back to it, is an impact fund that we've created uh, together with a fund manager partner, Granatos Ventures, it's called Tech for SDGs, and it's going to try to attract finance from impact investors around the world to solutions like that, that simultaneously deliver on the business side, are good for social or environmental purpose, and have you know, a, strong, um, a strong organizational you know, underpinning, a strong team in them. So this is what we do. And then how we do it, I'm going to keep it a secret for the next round uh, of questions and answers, uh, uh, but just to, to, to tease you that everything you do in this space has to be platform-based has to be bringing in players from different uh, uh, industries together and has to be without a preconception in mind, oh, we cannot do it, oh, this has nothing to do with this, oh, you and, and finance, no, they, those guys don't, guys don't work together. They do. Thank you. Thanks, Dima. Thanks, Dimitri. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm starting to get some questions in on uh, via Slido um, and uh, we will I'll, you know, just jump into, I want to make this as interactive as possible, as Steve mentioned. Um, um, but back to Nena for one, one point. So, so Dimitri talked a little bit about how you know, kind of building um, a sustainable finance ecosystem um, in Armenia. Um, you know, how do you? What about the aspect of, of really measuring if it's really sustainable or not? Right? If it's really impactful or not? Um, how's that going? How, I mean, do you see improvements sort of more broadly in? Um, Sort of impact measurement systems and, and, and indicators and for you, I mean, how, how, do, how, do you, how, yeah, how do you measure it? How do you know it's for real? I think that's an excellent question and I think that is what, what is probably the biggest barrier in terms of uh, really attracting mainstream capital towards impact investing. Um, I think, you know, even if you look at ESG guidelines, the E is pretty clear, the G is pretty clear. It's the S which is pretty vague in terms of how you measure it. Um, I do think that impact investors and impact investment um, opportunities realize that. Um, last month, the GIN, which is the Global Impact Investing Network, released um, Iris Plus, which is their uh, version two of their impact measurement, uh, uh, evalu impact measurement tool. I think that's a, it's a huge improvement over what Iris was, both in terms of I actually thought you needed a degree in rocket science to actually decipher Iris, but you know, Iris Plus is, I think, much, much more, uh, more user-friendly. It's much more um, uh, you know, based on metrics that people can understand and follow. Um, there's also something called the Impact Management Project, which, has been, which is a group that's been convened by a consortium of funders and investors, ranging from foundations to some of the largest pension funds in the world to actually mainstream impact investors and mainstream investors to come up with impact investment guidelines in order to streamline measurement. I think, you know, unless and until we do that, we're not going to really see the kind of uptake that we need in impact investment. But if you really think about it, um, standard accounting principles, you know, in terms of accounting guidelines only happened in the 1900s. So it's not that long ago that we didn't even have standard accounting guidelines. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, given how nascent the impact investing industry really is, uh, it was just about 10 years ago that the term was even coined, that, you know, I do feel we are moving much faster in terms of establishing impact investing metrics, but, but I think we need uniform standardized metrics and that's why AVPN is one of the partners of the Impact Management Project here in Asia to try and A, um, develop standardized metrics, but then communicate them across investors. Thanks. I'll, I'll um, 
add one more for you um, from, from the audience then, um, that's very Singapore specific. Uh, the question is, in Singapore, there's a lot of money floating around. How will we actually make the transition towards sustainability of these investments and who can make that happen? I think investors can make that happen. I mean, you know, it, at the end of the day, it is, it is demand from the market that actually leads to products. Um, so let me tell you some, give you some stats on, on Singapore, which, which will actually, if you don't know, then, you know, these are, these are things which are making a difference. So the Monetary Authority of Singapore introduced a green bond grant scheme in 2017. In, in January of this year, the Asia Sustainable Finance Initiative was formed here in Singapore. It's a multi-stakeholder forum to support financial institutions to develop sustainable finance instruments that they can offer their customers. Last year in October, the first $300 million sustainability linked loan was issued to Capital Land by DBS Bank. So these are all green finance, sustainable finance instruments that have originated here in Singapore. There is definitely a lot of money here in Singapore. Uh, what I find which is encouraging and different is that more and more family offices in Singapore are taking the lead to say that they want to have a portfolio that is sustainable. They want to look at a holistic return on their entire portfolio. So they don't want to, they want to look at a mix of you know, sort of discounted returns and market returns, but very clearly which are invested in a sustainable fashion. Um, and then one from the audience for, for David. Um, the question is, how can technology really tackle um, some of these um, challenges around climate change, for example? Um, Dimitri touched uh, on something similar. Right. Um, the, I think I, I hardly touched upon the, uh, about climate change, but if we look at blockchain, there are many ways of doing that. One way you can always trace the source of like where the palm oil comes from then you can really know the source of where wherever is happening so traceability is key to it and also that uh, you know in terms of carbon trading the, the major thing about blockchain and some of the new technology uh, working together with IOT sensors and so on is that you can actually look at uh, a lot of air quality a lot of um, you know issues about carbon trading and when you start trading and in blockchain space we call it the oracle which is external source of data you can you can can, can trace you can actually trade uh, some of these um, credits um, that, and then there, there are a lot of other ways to look at it um, from once you can start tracing you you tend to be able to see uh, what fertilizer they're using uh, what um, technology are using to to grow the agriculture products and so on. So the, the main thing is about tracing, the main thing is about transparency, the main thing is about the correct pricing, yeah. the cost of production, yeah. because at the end of the day, is we cannot have externalities on uh, you know, the entire population where you are actually lowering your cost um, by doing things which are harmful to the environment. So that's the crux of the issue. And you've got to use technology to be able to find out where it is and then do the, it's, it's just simple finance, you just price it correctly. So instead of just investing, uh, we can actually balance that, right? One is the measurement of impact investment, which is difficult, but you do a reverse engineering, you can actually looking at, uh, the, because the cost of production of some of these goods are too low, the externalities are not priced. Right, uh, right. So it's, it's a different side of the equation. So with the, the, the new technology. The, the externa well, the externality of sustainability is not priced. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, so you could actually then work out, you can trace where it is then, you have imposed the cost on the rest, then I'm going to impose the cost on you yeah. uh, to, to correctly, correctly um, reflect the cost of production, yeah. which is a fair economic uh, problem to solve. You yeah. know, and technology could solve that kind of problem. Thank you. Um, there's some other interesting, um, traceability related solutions too going on, for example, in the apparel business, right? The massive, massive um, clothing companies um, that do a lot of their production in this part of the world. Um, and in fact, UNDP is doing um, some work with um, uh, a very cool uh, blockchain uh, company that, um, yeah, is helping us with traceability all the way from the origin to, to consumer to ensure that it really is sustainable um, production. Um, Okay, another question from the audience, um, so I'm going off script. Um, <laughs> um, 
the question was, I can't find it now, but the question is one I'll pose to Dimitri. Um, with SDGs so context specific, so locally specific, um, and the challenge is so specific to each context, um, is, is really the VC model, the venture capital model of acceleration that you mentioned, the only way to solve that? Or what are the other ways, the other inputs into um, solving these really complicated problems that you mentioned? Well, the, first of all, there are many universal challenges that all countries share. But even those that are specific, you know, the, the model that I'm describing, where you put the tech, the entrepreneurs, and the financiers in one room and come up with out-of-the-box solutions uh, for SDGs, is uh, not specific to any country. This is an algorithm for just doing things differently, not assuming we know what a solution is to a problem until we've, we've had you know, a few tech guys to look at it from a completely different point of view. In talking about Internet of Things and, and, and uh, uh, climate change, just maybe, you know, what I was really inspired by one example that was given by our colleagues in Sri Lanka. Uh, monsoon rains, uh, uh, rapid flooding, very big problem there. The, the, the really big problem, however, you know, and the, of course the intensity of, of the rains has, uh, has grown with climate change, is not the rain, but the drainage system. And the clogging of the drainage system is one of the leading causes of uh, spikes in malaria uh, and dengue uh, epidemic in, in Sri Lanka and you know, dozens of other countries around the world that has, have similar uh, weather patterns. Uh, and so can technology do something? to have easy and early alert on the clogging of drainage system. You know, imagine the cost of, prevent, you know, of treating malaria. Imagine the cost of cleanup. Imagine the cost associated, you know, the loss to the economy associated with this. Uh, and imagine the cost of thinking of smart sensors, you know, on a, on a, let's say, on a blockchain platform, and then having, having a rapid response team working to, to clean the drainage where it's really you know, clogged. Because how do you know which one is clogged? So this is about a waterproof, IoT a technology that can really can really work in Sri Lanka and ten different countries like that. I'm not saying it's needed in Armenia, but let's let's create platforms that bring uh, people uh, that can design such solutions. Because the traditional way how the UN or other donors work, a log frame approach, three-year project with a lot of consultants and millions of dollars invested in it, and an expert-based opinion, this is the way you're going to do it in Sri Lanka, and we're going to roll it out year after year. It's simply not going to work to 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 solve this kind of complex problems. So we are we're trying to, in a way, reverse engineer development here, uh, and uh, I would like to maybe just short remark on who is going to change finance to the sustainability side. I fully agree it's the finance sector itself. It's going to be driven by customers for retail banks that are getting more and more um, uh, questions on that side, but it's also uh, smart business people see market opportunities. Our job as the UN one of the things we can do is create a deal flow, create a sense that there are these opportunities. Even examples I'm giving you now, smart people in the room will go and come up with a startup and sell it to a good investor a month later, and I'm very happy if you do. Uh, but we would like to do this a bit on scale, a bit more systematically. And so the, 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 uh, as an interesting indication, the Tech for SDGs fund that I've just mentioned, uh, the finance guys, the fund manager, has nothing to do initially with, with SDGs. Uh, we're given a task to create a fund with its target of $10 million in three years. Uh, we've ca they've come back to us and said, no, we would like a $40 million fund in three years. We don't think 10 is ambitious enough. We don't think the big impact investors who are interested in this will be attracted to a $10 million fund. Let's make it a 40. So we have now set up a $40 million tech for SDGs fund. And this is, I don't know, idea going out of Armenia, this is a much bigger ecosystem here with much more money. And I, I, I challenge you, many more people who understand that sustainable solutions, that addressing climate, uh, that uh, finding new ways for food systems to work are huge, hugely lucrative businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Well, on that, um, one of the audience members said, well, Asian investors don't care about ESG or the SDGs or sustainability. They care about returns. What can be done about that? Handing that one to, to, to Nina. 
<laughs> no, absolutely. They do care about returns. And that's why, you know, I think um, what's interesting mm -hmm. is that you have more and more businesses that are actually coming out in this space that, that are promising market returns uh, while, while operating sustainably. I think um, it's going to be very difficult for a business to continue polluting or to continue being uh, not, not conscious of its footprint, uh, you know, in its community or in its, in its environment, uh, and, and yet continue to provide uh, positive returns. I think uh, while, while Asian investors may not at this point say that, you know, we do care about ESG or we care about, about the impact, if you really look at the data um, and you look at the trends, companies that are more sustainable, companies that have, uh, you know, uh, uh, positive um, uh, purchasing solutions, positive uh, 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 sort of supply chains, they tend to perform much better. They, they tend to perform better than market returns and over the longer term are a much better investment. That's, that's number one. Um, I also want to just briefly, I mean, just go off script for a second, Bradley, and, and touch on what Dimitri said. You know, a lot of this is not possible without platforms and without collaboration. In order to have businesses that can scale and, and actually provide market returns, you need capital along a continuum. So initially, if you're talking about the accelerator that, that Dimitri has in Armenia, the initial ideation to sort of getting to a point where they are ready to be sort of incubated in the accelerator, ready to go through that acceleration program, they need to be supported by patient capital. I mean, I mean, there's no getting away from that. And that's where, you know, I think blended finance needs to come in, needs to play a role before we go to the point where that startup is ready to be scaled up to a point where it will look at providing market returns. Do we have examples of organizations that are impactful and provide returns at market? Yes. Are there enough of them? No. So, you know, there is, there is a gap in the financing you know, especially where what, what people like to call the missing middle, the valley of death, the pioneer gap, depending on what report you have read where. But there is, there is a gap in finance. There is, there is a gap between, and that gap in finance, unfortunately, is lack of uh, interest from mainstream financial institutions to provide debt or to provide investment capital to organizations that have sort of gone beyond the reach of, you know, patient capital or capital from friends and family and are looking for more market, uh, more money from the market. Thanks, Nina. Well, it, Singapore's ecosystem seems to be at this, um, well, this opportune moment or maybe this tipping point, right, where, as you pointed out, there, there's a lot of money here. There's Tomasic now with the ABC World Fund that's just announced, um, not yet putting the money to work yet, um, and TPG Rise, which is um, arguably the biggest um, impact or sustainable finance fund in the world is, is that has its regional headquarters here too. Um, um, so there seems to be a lot of intent, a lot of potential, a lot of family offices that, that are interested in this space. And so it's a matter of sort of joining forces, putting together that, that ecosystem just to start making it really accelerate at this point. Um, I mean, one interesting question uh, for Professor uh, David Lee. Um, uh, the question is, that. Uh, it presumes that there's a lot of greenwashing um, in sustainable finance, right? Um, people kind of pretend or fake um, impact investing or, or fake sustainable investment, um, to put it maybe more bluntly. Um, how can we use technology to help minimize this? <laughs> well, I, I don't really have the answers to that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just wanted to add more, I mean, to, to what we have discussed earlier, rather to address that question directly, is that I, I think um, if you, you have read the news the last few days, a lot of uh, family offices are really piling up on cash. So you can see that um, there's a lot of money in the market, and people just really do not know what to do. But if you, if you are looking five to ten years ahead, um, you, you, the, one of the most important costs of doing business is compliance. Yep. So compliance over time will continue to go out with technology. 
technology will give transparency, will give traceability. Mm. And therefore, if you, if you are doing any business that uh, pollute, that actually is not having a sustainability uh, purpose in what you are doing, you will see that your compliance costs will continue to go up. That's on the cost side. And as, as government beginning to realize how important it is, yesterday we had the Singapore FinTech uh, annual gala dinner and uh, MES, uh, Ravi Menon has just got the FinTech person of the world and in his speech he, he emphasized financial inclusion. And you can see that regulators are beginning to realize how important it is. And if you look at entire uh, Singapore um, you know, ministries and including SG Innovate and so on, that there's a lot of funding uh, going into the area of sustainability. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're investing in those areas and realizing that um, you need to have a, a stable environment. A, a lot of inequalities lead to unstable environment. A, a lot of uh, injustice lead to a lot of instability. So around the region, you really have to look into that. And you can see from the, from the, I would say, I wouldn't say it's subsidy, but from the cost of being business again, a lot of the, the projects that we we, are, we have invested in, we soon find that we are we are hardly having any dilution, partly because whenever there is a new project to be to be uh, engaged in, and it has a you know good purpose, uh, there will be funding out there, not from the shareholder funds, but there will be grants out there to actually help to experiment with some of this um, you know new venture, the new app, new platform, new technology. So the way to deal with that is that we have to all work together and in terms of imposing the cost, that's one area to ensure that uh, the cost is being imposed on those businesses that do not achieve the, the purpose that the government uh, one on the other hand, uh, if there's certain granting agency working together to ensure that the genuine project are uh, being funded to reduce the cost of the investors. So on hindsight, where eventually five years, ten years time, the investors looking at, at the returns, they can work it out today, discount the returns from the future, knowing that the business they invested in, the compliance cost, will continue to go up, and knowing that the other business they invested in, who is doing, who are all doing good, are actually have no dilution. Um, automatically, the future returns is going to be high. So it is just pure economics, pure financial economics, and that is because of technology bringing traceability, bringing transparency, and bringing understanding to that. And I just have one point to add, and Singapore is very interesting because Singapore understands the importance of tokenization. Mm -hmm. And therefore you see that when you trade on tokens, there's, there's no GST as well. Yeah. Right? So, and, and on a macro level, eventually it will be like hardware, uh, technology is just not about software, even hardware. So it's about trade. So the trade agreement with the region so, is really set up. So that is where I think uh, the cost of uh, return, you know, will, will, will substantially be affected by the macro picture, the the, uh, the compliance costs, and the, and and also the grants and so on. So, so one of the insights that that came out of what you just said um, is that technology will just lead to much more transparency about the cost, right? With cost of compliance or, or whatever else. Uh, cost of production as well. Because yes. Then you need to apportion the cost yeah. that is being imposed on the external yeah. parties, which is yeah. what we are talking about yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Which then should lead to more sustainable finance. Well, kind of along those lines, I, I remember having a, a chat once with um, uh, Hiro Mizuno, who's the, in charge of running the pension fund in Japan, which happens to be, I think, the, I mean, the largest, one of the largest has to be um, pools of capital managed by one entity. It's something like $1.5 trillion. Um, and he's been hailed as a hero in this space, no pun intended, or maybe a pun intended, um, because he's moving that massive pool of cash into ESG, sort of environmental governance um, related investment metrics. Kind of well, that was one of the questions that came out. Sort of this, this maybe the step before, in a way, um, really SDG metric um, uh, investments, and that's a huge, big deal, right? Um, in, in, in especially in this world, of, in that world of asset owners, asset managers, um, because he's pioneering it for the rest of the world. Um, 
but the way he explained it to me was, it's not a revolution, it's just, you know, the pension fund is about very long-term investment horizon, right? Sustainability is long-term investment, right? So it's, it's common sense, it's sort of built into the definition, right, of a long-term investment horizon. Um, so from at least the Japanese perspective, it wasn't um, such a huge sell, I guess. Um, so, Nana, if, if you were to pick one or two or three things that Singapore needed to just really accelerate its move into sustainable finance, what would those be? Thanks. So I think, you know, firstly, I think access to sort of um, having, well, looking at what is the role of government, looking at what is the role of uh, government and MAS. I think MAS has talked a lot about uh, sustainable finance, about encouraging um, uh, Singaporean financial institutions to move in the direction of sustainable finance. So I think, you know, what, what it does, whether it's, you know, the carrot route or the stick route, I think that'll be, that'll be interesting and will be a point to see. Um, I think in terms of um, having, um, having a pool of capital that has a higher appetite for risk and, you know, how do we actually uh, generate that pool of capital here, whether it's actually by forming uh, coalitions among different uh, capital providers where some have a higher appetite for risk versus others, but all are sort of, you know, agreed upon kind of impact goals. I think that will be very, very helpful. And, uh, you know, setting up of thematic hubs here whether the interest is actually looking at impact tech or looking at fintech or looking at agrotech, I think all of that is, uh, is, will be a definite plus in terms of making Singapore the hub for uh, innovative social finance. Cool. Insights. Um, so the, getting to sort of parting comments as we're getting close to time, I think, now, but I'd like to have time also just to, to chat with all of you. Um, Professor, some last. On, on links between uh, technology and, and sustainability. Yeah, I think um, we have come to a tipping point where uh, the technology is actually matured enough. Uh, there some of them are not, but I think within the next five years, we will see a lot of technology that can solve a lot of problems that the government have been trying to solve for the past 20 years. Uh, and also that we could see that a lot of technology are doing things that currently the corporate are uh, trying to solve, they couldn't solve. So I would see that the technology will, will actually bring around a whole new different areas of uh, tokenization. So I, I'm, I'm seeing technology helping even pension funds because we need to redefine how uh, asset classes are being distributed and you know having um, having a technology like a blockchain or something that can actually distribute assets to pensioners to people who are um, perhaps digital, digitally not uh, literate uh, in a way so that we can have more even distribution using technology to the people not defined by just by money but defined by what you need to consume. So we can look at the consumption patterns and then we can actually tokenize the needs and distribute those tokenized assets uh, through a digital means to people who need it the most. And I think uh, that will be the key to sustainability because it's always the case that the needy pay higher charges for anything, finance, finance services and everything. It is a very good market for businesses, and businesses haven't really got to that, but technology will bring them towards that direction. And it is so sustainable in the sense that just, just too many people are excluded. And we have the digital devices now, we have distributed ledger, we have convergence of technology. All this will actually reach out to the people that uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't reach, including the refugees. Uh, like some of the project that uh, SG Nova is investing in is the identity for refugees and so on, so that we, we, the technology itself eventually for sustainability has to empower uh, the, the needy, you know, the weak, the small, you know, and the neglected. And if we can do that, I think, um, you know, we are, we are towards the right direction. Great, great call for action too. Uh, then, Dimitri, um, your your um, last thoughts um, on all of this, especially from the perspective of um, an emerging market 
a not so developed country context in which you're working in and building scalable models for the, uh, the rest of the world in terms of um, innovative finance. Um, and also maybe the, a bit on what the, what the UN and UNDP can, can help with this yeah. ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you, Bradley. Uh, let me try to maybe start with what we can concretely do. So first of all, continue unpacking SDGs as a market opportunity, specifically from the tech perspective. And here I really agree that uh, consumer-oriented tech is easy, but the really profitable long-term, long-term, is the deep tech, more complicated problems addressed with more com complicated, sophisticated tech solutions. So we shouldn't shy away from that. Secondly, move our own funding, which we have. Uh, we, uh, UNDP operates a $5 billion budget every year, grant funding projects around the world. Move a certain percentage of that to models that involve tech in sourcing solutions. And, 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 and that will already be a shift within the system, within the develop, development community, but a signal to the financial market that these guys are serious. So this is what we're doing with our Tech for SDGs fund. I hope this can be done at scale. And that's why, that's why it was so important for me to come over here to Singapore, because I think the UNDP Singapore Center can be one of the nodes in the movement of the entire UN family globally uh, to create, you know, these linkages between tech and finance and, and, and leverage funding from various sources to make this possible, including to de-risk the early stages. So this is the third thing. We should create safe spaces, uh, safe spaces for entrepreneurs who, are, um, who would take risks. And uh, those uh, safe spaces have to be platform-oriented. We, we, there have to be multiple services there. Sometimes you need market intelligence. Sometimes you need to have access to finance. Sometimes you need to have tech advisory. And a country like Armenia is a relatively small market would benefit a lot. And by the way, there are 50 countries like Armenia, small, low, middle-income countries. They could be a great platform for a big player like Singapore to come with tech solutions with, with know-how and, and, you know, can consider them also as a market for you in terms of the platform building. Uh, finally, I think we need to be honest to ourselves and stop pretending that uh, these problems don't exist. Uh, uh, they say you can't really count all your money if you're flooded, right? Uh, but I would, I would just challenge ourselves to think about uh, the uh, the future generations, and whether it's the, what, we, what is on our table or what we breathe, this is going to be the distinguishing factors of the quality of life, uh, and that can be evaluated very highly. The more developed the society, in fact, the higher the quality, the cost of life, and the quality c c demands are. So I think there has to be government action as well, and the UN's role is to advocate with governments for policy change that would stimulate that space. And then we see this happening. We're very glad to see Singapore taking those steps. So Singapore could also take a lead in terms of policy change in that direction. And by the way, uh, related to that, and I'll end with that, uh, my famous, my, sorry, my most favorite use of blockchain, I don't think it's been done yet, it's called promise monitoring. So when a politicians make promises before an election, <laughs> blockchain should Verbat verbatim, verbatim, register that. And imagine a website that says, such and such, elected president, promised this in March, now is July. If, you know, it goes red because, you know, they already, you know, went back on their promise. Imagine a map of red and green around the world with politicians who are not being kept accountable to their promises. Well, at least one promise I hope they can meet. They promised to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. I think here in this space, actors in this room uh, can put together tech and finance to help the politicians. But let's also bring them on board to help us help them. Thank you. Thanks. 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 And, um, well, just one more big round of thank you to our panelists. Uh, first of all, so big round of applause. Thanks very much. Um, big thank you to, to Steve and Tuan and everyone at SG Innovate um, and for this partnership and sort of building this community around, sustainable, around sustainability and, and technology um, here in Singapore and, and beyond. And, and if you're excited about all of this, all this stuff that we've been talking about um, today, um, 
really, if you really want to make your ideas, your ventures, your businesses, your investments more sustainable, reach out and talk to us. Talk to me, talk to Steve, talk to Tuan, talk to Arndt, talk to Anne um, at UNDP and SG Innovate um, over the next hours, days, whatever. And uh, we're happy to help you uh, do that. Um, and as, as Steve um, teased you all in the beginning, um, um, Stay, you know, stay tuned for, for some exciting new developments in this space um, that we'll be uh, announcing together in the next couple of days to, to make you even more engaged. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. I just sent you a LinkedIn, right? Oh, so that we can talk more.